The other thing that happened was that when the U.S. government printed $13 trillion, people kind of went, what? All of a sudden, they've immediately diluted the dollar by 20 or 30 percent. Tim Draper is a billionaire venture capitalist and outspoken Bitcoin bull. He reportedly owns nearly 30,000 Bitcoins, which would be worth almost half a billion dollars today. I think the pandemic is one thing. It's a, it's a horrible thing. A million people are going to die from the pandemic. But 135 million people are going to die from starvation because of the government's reaction to the pandemic. The UN has warned that the threat of famine due to conflict, climate change, and COVID-19 could reach biblical proportions without immediate action. In this video, Draper explores how tokenization can optimize food delivery systems to combat global hunger. He also predicts that the ongoing pandemic may accelerate the timeline of his famous Bitcoin to $250,000 projection. This interview is brought to you by Rachel Wolfson, staff writer for Cointelegraph and host of the Crypto Chick podcast. Hi, Tim. How are you? Hi, Rachel. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you as well. Um, thank you again for taking the time to chat with me today for Cointelegraph. Great. Yeah, I'm happy to. I'm quarantining right now. I went away on a weekend trip and um, my wife has sent me to quarantine. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Sounds fun. I want to get your thoughts on this because I think that this whole COVID-19 pandemic is kind of pushing blockchain and kind of making it go a little bit more mainstream because we need digitalization right now. So do you think that um, because of the pandemic, we're seeing more opportunities in the blockchain and DLT space? Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's interesting. A couple of things have happened with the pandemic. In some, some people say it's condensed the time, um, but th that we've, for us to adopt new technologies. And so people are stuck in place and they're saying, yeah, why don't I try, uh, see what VR is like. Um, I'm gonna use this for remote medicine. I, I have to use it for remote education. Um, so some of these things that we've been backing over time have gotten a lot of attention uh, during the pandemic and grown very quickly because um, people have been stuck in place. <clears throat> the other thing that happened was that when the U.S. government printed $13 trillion, uh, people kind of went, what? All of a sudden, they've immediately diluted the dollar by 20 or 30 percent. Uh, that's a real shock to the system. And people looked and said, well, wait, where do I put money? Um, and, you know, do I put it in the old fashioned way? Do I put it into gold or do I put it into this Bitcoin where where it's a great um, a store of value? It um, and so a lot of people have said, well, hey, I want to I want to move it to Bitcoin. So um, I think a couple of different things have happened. I think the pandemic is one thing. It's a it's a horrible thing. A million people are going to die from the pandemic. But 135 million people are going to die from starvation because of the government's reaction to the pandemic, because of the lockdowns. They tell you you can't travel, they, you can't be uh, in restaurants or bars or hotels or whatever. And all of a sudden, that, that lockdown shuts off all these supply chains around the world. And so people, people are starving because our government and other governments just decided they would lock down. Whenever there's a crisis, there's a great opportunity to do something extraordinary. When, the, when there was a financial crisis, Satoshi Nakamoto came up with Bitcoin. And I think as uh, we're able to put more uh, <clears throat> restriction, more uh, uh, accounting systems and, and whatever around the blockchain, uh, we're going to be able to use Bitcoin uh, interchangeably with dollars, and I think the world is going to be much better off. If you know anything about Bitcoin, then you've probably seen this chart before. That's because the stock to flow model developed by Plan B is one of the most popular theories on Bitcoin's long term price action. According to the model, Bitcoin's limited supply will drive its price to over $100,000 in one year from now. 
However, a recent report by crypto asset data firm ByteTree says the stock to flow model is fundamentally flawed. It would be really nice if that model was true. And yes, it's very, very good that there's a, that there's a finite supply of Bitcoin. Um, that makes Bitcoin credible, but it doesn't create value. If the stock to flow model is not a reliable indicator, then what are the real factors driving Bitcoin's price action? And according to these factors, how much Bitcoin could be worth in one year from now? To answer these questions, we reached out to Charlie Morris, CIO and co-founder at Byte3. I'm Giovanni, your host, and this is another exclusive Cointelegraph interview. In a latest report published by Byte3, you debunked the stock-to-flow model as a reliable uh, model to calculate the appreciation of Bitcoin. So what is your argument against the stock-to-flow model? Well, I suppose that, you know, sum it up by it's too good to be true. I mean, it would be really nice if that model was true. And I think the stock to flow is very much a, a, a technical argument. You know, you're saying you're squeezing the market, therefore you'll force the price higher. But I revert to the gold market. You know, no one, I, I know a lot of people in the gold market, you know, the serious people in the gold market. And, and yes, people talk about mine supply uh, as, a, as a factor, but it's fairly considered to be a very minor factor, uh, not a major factor. No one thinks that if you shut down gold mining, um, that the price of gold will go to infinity. It's just not the way it works. You know, when you've got a vast amount of gold out there, you know, it's that that you're valuing and a small amount of new supply, you know, that, that's an irrelevance. And I'll also point to, you know, back in 2009, 10, 11, uh, the Bitcoin inflation rate was really, really high. In other words, the stock to flow was, was um, negligible. And at that time, I would say it's the other way around. I would say the miners massively influenced price. Um, when, when they dominated the network. But in the future, they, they will be insignificant in the network. And obviously, they'll do hard work behind the scenes to, to keep it going. But economically, they'll be far less significant in the future um, because, because the number of coins that they have in inventory and produce become less and less. So they won't have the impact. And it's completely wrong to think that the only place you can buy Bitcoin is from a miner. I mean, it's on, uh, to the contrary, it's, it's a massive liquid network. You can buy it from all sorts of actors in the space for all sorts of different reasons. You know, so they do not have a monopoly on new supply. Uh, and to assume that they, you know, the, the, the STF model kind of assumes that that's the case, that, that, that you're squeezing the whole thing and then and we're running out of Bitcoin. It's just not the case. I, I suppose the, 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 you know, the, the, the final point is, is, yes, I like tight supply. Yes, it's very, very good that there's a, that there's a finite supply of Bitcoin. There'll never be 20, more than 21 million uh, Bitcoins. That's great. That provides confidence and stability. Um, that makes Bitcoin credible, but it doesn't create value. Value comes from the actors in the space. You know, more people using Bitcoin, more adoption, um, um, a, a, a busier network, vibrant technologies. All of these things create value. The supply side just creates stability, not value. We can keep our power. Hold on to our power. I guess I've been playing wrong this whole time. You have been playing Monopoly wrong. What's up, YouTube? My name is Jackson, and today I'm here with billionaire, venture capitalist, and Bitcoin bull, Tim Draper. How are you doing today, Tim? Doing great. Doing great. It's a beautiful day, wonderful feeling. Everything's great. Awesome. So I've watched a lot of um, a lot of interviews with you, and I've noticed that you're always oh, I, in. Yeah, the... I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've okay, enjoyed what them. Have you noticed? I've enjoyed them so far, so don't worry, not a problem. But I've noticed that you're always in this location, and I haven't seen anyone ask you what's on you, the whiteboard behind you. Ha! I never know. I, it's always, it varies. It's, uh, I use it for sort of brainstorming, so it could be anything. Uh, it, it's uh, plans, a lot of interesting things I'm thinking about up there, um, but probably things I thought about two or three weeks ago and now, Either I've done them or they're out of sight, out of mind. Uh huh. Anything you're particularly excited about? I notice just from looking there, it looks like you've got Dai on there. Is that in reference to uh, MakerDAO's cryptocurrency, or is that something different? <laughs> yeah, I'm actually a, an owner of uh, some Maker and a big fan of it. I I am uh, I'm excited. It uh, it brings you know. Bitcoin's really the, the ultimate solution, making it all crypto and all. Um, but this is a nice bridge 
that allows uh, us to kind of bridge our current banking system with the post-banking world. Uh, once the banks are, um, you know, have uh, have either transformed themselves or gone out of business, uh, uh, this is this is what will allow the consumer to uh, move from uh, that that old world where it was fiat currency and it was all tied to governments and and tribal and all that to this new world that's global, transparent, decentralized, and open. Um, so it's, um, I think it's exciting, and I think Maker has figured out a really nice model uh, for how, uh, how they're going to uh, match the old world with a new world. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was watching- but when ultimately it down the road, I see this as a Bitcoin economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was watching um, an interview you did with Bloomberg where you said that when you're investing, you look at industries that have the uh, worst service for the highest cost. So at Draper Associates, the way we look at the next big thing is we look for industries where you're getting really bad service at a really high cost. Is MakerDAO, is DAI an example of a solution you see to an industry that gives a poor service? for a high cost? Yeah, yeah, banking and finance. Um, finance, I can say that because I'm in the finance world. Um, I believe that uh, banking provides uh, bad service at a high cost at this point uh, because, I mean, they're charging two and a half to 4% every time you swipe a credit card and we're not getting real value for that. Uh, it, it can be done with Bitcoin for almost frictionlessly, almost free. Um, it can be uh, done so many, in so many ways, in a better way than it's being done. And the banks are getting um, more and more um, where they're charging fees for things that they never used to charge fees for. So I, I get the feeling that this is like the, the roar of the dying lion. Uh, they're they're trying to hold on. They're clinging to their their past uh, glory, but uh, but really the world is moving in a new direction, and they uh, they either are going to get on board or they're going to uh, become extinct. So this is a really exciting time, and yes, it is. They do provide bad service at a high cost, and and there are very few of them. And they, they have sort of a monopolistic moat because if you wanted to start a bank today to compete with them, it, it would cost you $50 million. It would, uh, that's a huge moat. No one really wants to start a new bank today. Um, there are very few people do. And, and uh, I think if banks, um, they have that moat, they have this oligopoly, and so we all have to deal with whatever they all start throwing at us. And if one group charges, decides, hey, instead of two and a half to four percent, we're going to charge three to five percent. All of a sudden, we're all paying three to five percent, or the the merchants are. Um, and then we have to pay by um, osmosis. They. This is uh, a very. Uh, it's interesting. But banks aren't the only group that are providing bad service at a high cost uh, because they're an oligopoly, uh, because crypto, uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, smart contracts, you combine them with an actuary and you have an insurance company. And insurance also provides bad service at a high cost. And that's why, you know, you see all these ads for insurance companies trying to you know, get your business because they're clearly um, making a fortune off of you. Um, actually, using a smart contract is and using an actuary and sort of some AI. Uh, use you use AI to uh, check out fraud. You can actually create a really great insurance company uh, for very little. Um, and what is government but an a bunch of insurance companies? 
And so I think government is probably the industry that provides the worst service at the highest cost. And, uh, and that's true throughout the entire world. And they're all gonna have to start competing for us, at least at this virtual level, where a government can provide better insurance than they do today um, by using uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, smart contracts, artificial intelligence, and just a, a good actuary. If Bitcoin ever reaches one trillion, that's still 10% the size of gold. Could it reach 10% of gold's market cap? I think so. This is strategic investor Lynn Alden. Back in 2017, she was highly skeptical of Bitcoin. I was concerned with dilution, right? So so if there's no kind of one network effect that kind of retains control, uh, you could see that kind of market cap distributed among multiple different protocols. In the three years since then, the world has changed dramatically. The coronavirus has spread quickly around the world, leaving a tragic and growing toll of illness and lost lives. Yes, yeah, Stu, this is the biggest push yet that I've seen from the Federal Reserve Chairman to get more fiscal stimulus into the economy. Against this new macroeconomic backdrop, Alden's stance toward Bitcoin has done a nearly 180 degree turn. We can look at price history, we can look at you know market share, we can look at all the different ways of measuring a network effect and see that you know the thesis for Bitcoin's network effect is playing out. In our conversation, Lynn explains why 2020 may be one of the most favorable years to invest in Bitcoin. My name is Jackson and welcome to another exclusive Cointelegraph interview. Back in, I think, 2017, you had an analysis of Bitcoin that was uh, overall bearish. And since then, in your 2020 blog post, you've turned bullish. So could you take a moment to explain the, the factors that led you to change your position there? Uh, you know, at the time we were seeing, you know, we saw the hard fork. Uh, and then we're also seeing, uh, you know, Bitcoin's market share of the cryptocurrency space was declining. And so my, I was concerned with dilution. Right. So so if there's no kind of one network effect that kind of retains control, uh, you could see that kind of market cap distributed among multiple different protocols that I was like, you know, I'm just going to watch this for now. Uh, I think it, there's a lot of enthusiasm here. Uh, and so, you know, about two and a half years later in, in early 2020 here, uh, Bitcoin basically round tripped all the way to the same price. Uh, so it was in like the six to seven thousand range. Uh, but so you can get it the same price as you could back at, in, you know, 2017. But the network effect was much stronger. I mean, the ecosystem around Bitcoin was stronger. Uh, the, the use case was stronger. The macro backdrop was stronger. So it could have been, it, we could have had, for example, a challenger come along and, and possibly, you know, uh, take some market share. Uh, we could have had you know, issues around the, some of the hard forks. We could have had more split communities. Uh, but so far, you know, Bitcoin has survived all of those kind of various kind of uh, riskier moments for it. Uh, so, you know, now from a, from looking back in, in early 2020 when I made my investment, uh, you know, a lot of those initial concerns were addressed. It, it survived a lot of the, the, the challenges coming up to it. Uh, I think the path to dependency is, is a key thing. And I, I incorporated that into part of my argument that, you know, Bitcoin came first. Uh, there could have been potentially an early challenger to kind of take it away a little bit. Uh, but from what we've seen, you know, it, it built up that that security advantage from a very, really early period. And because especially as a store of value, security is the most important attribute for, for uh, you know, a, a digital asset to have. And so the fact that Bitcoin has the highest hash rate, it has tons of decentralization, uh, you know, uh, really kind of, you know, has a really kind of fixed uh, monetary policy, right? We know exactly how many Bitcoins uh, pretty much are going to be uh, created over any given time period, uh, which you don't get that with some of the other protocols. Uh, so, you know, it's basically only strengthen the argument over time. And the further we go, the more we can, we can look at price history, we can look at, you know, market share, we can look at all the different ways of measuring a network effect and see that, you know, the thesis for Bitcoin's network effect is playing out. Yeah, Bitcoin's kind of interesting because its network effect is like inherently tied to its security protocol. You know, yeah. the bigger it gets, the more secure it gets. So it, it kind of like builds on itself in that way. Yeah. So it's it's definitely interesting to invest in. And um, and speaking of that, you know, I think a lot of people could probably guess where I'm kind of going with this. We had this news recently of PayPal integrating Bitcoin payments into its system. And a lot of people are incredibly bullish on this news. I mean, we saw the price skyrocket. Mike Novogratz has called it the, the shot heard around the world on Wall Street. Cointelegraph reported that 
this PayPal integration could potentially double or triple network, uh, Bitcoin's network effect. So if we're talking about uh, investing in Bitcoin as an investment in its network effect, how big